Hello, my name is Austin Fire, and welcome to part two of my discussion about The Expanse as a series as a whole. Um, this will probably be the longest video, maybe, maybe not, it depends. It depends on how much I have to say, because um, like when I was just talking about the Druida Shinar, where I really got into the characters, uh, talking about characters can really get me going for a very long time, so we'll see what happens here. But, alright, so the best, I guess the best way to start is saying that the Expanse is very much driven by its characters. The characters in the Expanse are its strongest element. They're the things that, they're the, they're the things, I mean, and you might say this about almost any story, but in some stories it's definitely, there's more about the overarching narrative and so forth that is the stronger part, and the characters are kind of just tokens in there. But here the characters are the primary element that kind of ties everything together and keeps it grounded and keeps you engaged with the broader story. Um... And I think, I, I said at the beginning of the last video, but, you know, it, it's like, it, the characters, by grounding it, makes it much easier to connect with and understand the, um, the you know, like the elements of the story that might be harder to grasp, you know? If, you know, if, like, if James Holden or Naomi Nagata or anyone, for that matter, weren't relatable on some level, if they weren't recognizable as people, on some level rather than pieces on a chessboard um i don't think this series works even half as well as it does um all right so i guess we will start i have a, I have an itchy forehead that's fun so i guess we will start with james holden jim as the last book starts calling him um it's, it's really funny because of course all the previous eight books called him holden the entire time but leviathan falls decides that it's going to make him a little more personal and start calling him by, you know, the shortened nickname for him, for, for his name. Instead of saying Holden at the beginning of every chapter, he starts calling him Jim. Um, and I think that, I think it's a recognition of the change of his character from the first, from the first seven books to the last two. You know, he, you know, um, but I guess we'll kind of start with just by saying James Holden is probably my least favorite character on the crew. Um, it's not James. It's not Jim's fault. It's not. It's not Holden's fault in the slightest, you know. It, it, but it's like his. It's like his personality is like the is like the hardest to fathom. His ability to just kind of like leap in into into trouble all the time and to kind of like put his you know to put you know to put people in danger, you know, trying to do the right thing. It, it's just. It makes it makes Jim kind of like difficult to grasp sometimes because, again, a lot of the book, a lot of the events in the books are triggered, triggered, triggered even by his mistakes. His mistakes start a lot of the problems that happen in the various stories. Um, and it, it's like if he had been, if he had a little, if he had a slightly more, if he had a slightly wiser temperament, I think he'd be. I think he'd be an easier character to really like, you know, and I do like him, it's just that he'd be easier to like if he wasn't so prone to making mistakes. Now granted, the, his ability to make mistakes constantly is what humanizes him, um, but as someone who inadvertently gets thrust into positions of power, Holden also is the same person who kind of, his mistakes have a lot of broader long-term ramifications compared to others. On the other hand, James Holden also saves the day a lot. He, and he tries to make his mistakes right as often as he can. And I think that's the thing that really makes Holden so endearing at the end of the day, is the fact that, yeah, he's kind of an idiot, but he's an affable idiot. Um, and I think the way that the final trilogy of books, like, kind of, like, Kind of shows like an older James Holden, kind of the same, but also kind of different. And imprisoned by Laconia and tortured by Laconia, and then eventually the savior of humanity. Really, um, I think that's a much more interesting character arc for Holden, because I mean he spent the entirety of Leviathan Falls basically being a broken man, you know. But because he's Holden, he manages to hide it as often as he can. But everyone sees it. Everyone notices it in his expressions and his behaviors and his habits and everything and I like that I like that his character growth because I don't know it's like it makes you feel the weight 
that really has probably been on Holden's shoulders ever since he inadvertently triggered a conflict between Earth and Mars and Leviathan wakes. Um, it makes it kind of come into full view where it's like, he's had to make like tough decisions his entire life. And, and there's a phone ringing outside my door somewhere. I don't even know where it was. Well, someone made a phone call on speakerphone and the ring was very audible. Anyway, but, you know, like, that weight eventually wears on you, especially after you were made a political prisoner for, you know, like, five years or something. What was that? I can't remember how long it was in Laconia. But, um... But, yeah. I, I think I think he's a... I, I think... As much as he's my least favorite of the main crew, I also think that he needs to be there. I think he's a vital part of that crew. Um... And that is my thoughts on James Holden. Naomi Nagata is the glue... That holds that crew together. That holds the crew of the Rosinante together. Um, I think the I think the way she kind of goes from like kind of a shy wolf wallflowerish type type of character to the leader of an entire political organization, you know, political organization that's terrorist group, is one of the most fascinating character growths of the entire series. Um, she is not she's not a natural born leader by any stretch of the imagination. But the thing that the first book in itself um, manages to capture is the idea that she's very smart, very knowledgeable, and very capable of thinking on her feet. Um, this combination of things makes her a very makes her kind of like it makes her like a foundation, makes her like an anchor point for people. It's a you know she's you know she's the anchor of the crew of the Rosinante, often helping to you know often doing a lot of the groundwork that enables everyone else to get them out of jams and in many cases herself just doing the work needed to get the crew out of a jam you know she's you know her her high level of capability is just her greatest strength and her most interesting character trait and um and you know she's she's an, she's an actual she's an awesome character um i i don't i don't know what else to really say about her because it's like because on the because on the other hand, I also feel like she's kind of sort of the most emotionally detached. Now, this is funny because because you also have Amos Burton, right? But I feel like she's the most emotionally detached of the crew, and it makes her it makes her a little bit more unrelatable. Like she's more t you know like when she's with Holden, right? We get to see more of that in his interior, but otherwise she always has like a shell up. She always has her defenses up. They always talk about how she's how she was you know as a as a, as a uh, as a young woman was always hiding behind her hair, right? You know, always hiding her face behind her hair to avoid social interactions and stuff, right? Um, and I think that has the same effect on the reader, and that's fine, actually, because it's actually perfect characterization. Um, but it makes it harder to say things about her, I guess, because I can't talk about her emotional state. I have to talk about more how she's a technically useful character more than about how I emotionally related to her, right? But that's fine. Because I think that means her character did the job, did her job correctly. So that leads us to Alex Kamal. Alex is Alex is the dude that you want to go out with a go out and get a beer with, right? You know, he's very he's very easygoing, very laid back. He's a bit of a jokester. You know, he's 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 the he's the character that kind of keeps he keeps the he's the character that only keeps the crew's morale up. He keeps your morale up as the reader even when things have gotten dark because even when he's serious he's never so intense that he drags everyone down with him and you know but at the same time even though he's that he's also a hyper flawed character with two failed marriages and you know a, a child that he never got to see grow up and, you know, and, and it's like, but in the, in the story makes it very clear that Alex recognizes that these flaws are his own fault. And I guess it's relatable to a lot of people. I wouldn't know because I've never had a relationship to speak of. Um, but I think for a lot of people, I think for a lot of readers, that's a very relatable thing, you know. Failed relationships, failed marriages, and so forth. And I think that makes Alex so much, I think that makes Alex a very easy character to relate to. And I think that's part of the reason he's there. Because... In a lot of ways, he's a lot more... He's the most human character, you know? You know, Naomi's practically a walking computer. Holden is larger than life. Amos is a little bit too scary. Um, 
but Alex is always right there, down to earth. You know, the sort of the sort of guy that you know you could find yourself sitting next to in a bar, and you'd start talking to him, and it'd, and it'd be like you've been friends for years. You know, and that's his great strength as a character. And the idea that he went to Nuistat, remember the name after forgetting it last video, but after but you know his decision to take the Rosinante to Nuistat to you know to to stay with his to stay with uh, Kit was um, you know was a sad choice. It was sad that he you know they decided to they decided to break up the crew, but also an understandable one because it's like all right everything's changing again. This is my chance to kind of start anew. And that seems like a very Alex thing to do. Um, which leads me to Amos. Amos is probably my favorite character on the crew, legitimately. Even though he's, like, the most inscrutable, you know, we only get... We only really only get, like, strong hints as to what his past was like. We never get to know explicitly who Timothy was before Amos... You know, before he became Amos Burton. Um, but we do know that he had a very hard life. And it's the hardness in his life that kind of turned him into the sort of quiet, uh, into the sort of like quiet, always smiling, but never jovial sort of Amos Burton that we know. Um, I think that is, I, I don't know, there's something about the character I just, I, I connect with and in ways I don't really fully grasp why, but... I guess it's kind of like because he's a rock, you know? It's like, even if the rest of the crew is going to break, Amos is still going to be plugging away in engineering, you know? He's still going to be keeping the ship going, even if, very, even if everyone else were to fall apart. Because that's just how Amos is. You know, Amos is a bedrock in fights, and he... Even, and, you know, and even though it's very clear that he doesn't really have a strong moral compass... He is perfectly willing willing to follow Holden's moral compass. And that makes him reliable. And I think that's really... Um, I think that's just... I think it makes for a very... I think it makes for a very compelling character. You know? And the sort of character we don't need to know a lot about. And then, when, of course, when he gets killed and gets rebuilt, you know, we, you know, we, you know, we kind of have to deal with the other characters that kind of, like, trying to deal with the fact that basically he's, he's Amos, but he's also not Amos. Um... But Amos knows that he's Amos, but also not Amos. And that's very Amos of Amos. Honest to goodness. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, but it's it's very... You know, it's, it's kind of fitting that he would be the character that would end up living forever, you know? And I think, again, that's because he's very solid and, you know, hard to shake and break. You know, so of course he was there a thousand years later after the after the gates, um, after the gates went down. You know, of course he's still around because why wouldn't he be? He's a survivor, and he's stubborn, and he doesn't let himself get pushed around. All right, that is the main crew. So let us go on to the two secondary members, Bobby and Clarissa. Uh, we'll start with Bobby. I love Bobby. Bobby is so great. Her personality, larger than life. You know, she's a fighter. She's tough. She's huge. Intimidating. She scares people. She's a Marine. You know, everything about Bobby is just plain awesome. Um, you know? And yet she kind of finds herself in all these positions where it's like, you know, especially in book, what, like three and four and five. She's always in these positions where it's like, Okay, I'd rather be in a... I'd rather be in power armor, you know, shooting things, but I guess I'll do this... I guess I'll do all this bureaucratic stuff, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, like, it's like because we know that she's tough and strong and likes a good fight, you know, we, gotta, we can, you know, we can fully grasp her angst and frustration. And, you know, it's like... And, and when she finally joins the crew of the Rosinante, that's just... It's such a worthwhile moment. It's like it's like we needed her there. We knew we needed her there since book two. Um, you know, it, it's like she, she, you know, she was like she was like a part of the crew that we knew was missing, and we never got to, you know. And finally, she finally gets to join them, and that's just that's so awesome. And of course, she adds something to the crew too, because of course she's an ab she's an able gunner and she's a fighter, right? She's a fighter in, in personal conflict as well. Um, 
And of course, I remember when they're trying to get into the uh, into a little racing ship, um, you know, trying to escape with the uh, what is it, the the leader of Mars, right? And um, and you know, and for a moment, Alex thinks that she's going to sacrifice herself because you know she's in the power armor suit, and you know, and, and she just ends up kind of ripping a chair out, throwing it out of the ship, and squeezing in, and it's like, what, you think I was going to sacrifice myself? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, that, that's just a fun moment. I love that. I love moments like that. This, these books are filled with moments like that. And Leviathan Falls is filled with moments like that. Leviathan Falls is absolutely filled with tons of wonderful little character moments that just make me love it more. There's so many moments. And I mean, remember, I read this at work, but there's so many moments where I just laughed out loud or was just smiling because someone did something. Not Bobby, obviously, because Bobby's dead. But someone did something that just made me go, yeah, this is, that's classic. That's classic behavior. Maybe it's a little... Maybe it's a little nostalgic of me, but it's very, you know, it's very, it's, it's very well, well written, you know, but it's moments like, but anyway, but back to Bobby though, you know, the, and the force, the funny thing is that in the end, Bobby does sacrifice herself, doesn't she? You know, you know, Bobby does, you know, does sacrifice herself, but gloriously where she, you know, gets, gets, you know, get, you know, where she literally you know, after releasing a, you know, after releasing an antimatter bomb to destroy the, uh, to destroy the, uh, what is it, the Tempest, um, you know, she, you know, with her ship disabled and her, in her, in her crewmate dead, um, you know, she literally just flings herself out into space, you know, and starts literally shooting at a super battleship and dies, but does what she needs to, to stop the, the Tempest from dodging the bomb. You know, and I think that's, you know, like there's there's very few deaths, there's very few character deaths that I think are better than that. Honest to goodness, I think there's very few character deaths you'll find that are better than that. Um, and then of course Clarissa. Clarissa is actually legitimately one of my favorite characters in the entire series. Um, there's just something about the idea of her, the idea of, you know, basically a rich kid who loses everything and goes on a quest for vengeance. And then realizes, and then has like this little redemption arc where she realizes, oh, maybe I'm the asshole. <laughs> and ends up helping to save the day at the end of the third book, of course, Abaddon's Gate. Um, and then coming back a couple of books later to actually join the crew. Uh, I, I don't know. There's just something about her story that I really love. You know, something about the character I really love. And, you know, I'm just kind of glad. You know, I was glad to see her come back. I was glad that a Amos went to visit her and then saved her, and brought her along. And she was just part. You know, just just became part of it. And then, of course, she has to nobly sacrifice herself as well because she's dying from her own choices. You know, from the implant, um, and ultimately decides that the best thing she can do is to use the implant one final time and save. You know, and save the Rosinante's crew. And, I don't know, even though she doesn't get nearly as much time in the, in the, as much time in the spot, spotlight as most other characters, um, there's just something about her that just makes me really, just really love her as a character. Um, you know, I make, I just, I just do. You know, and I, and I, and she makes a, such a fine addition to the crew, you know, it's like, just like Bobby, it's like she, there's some part of her that should have just been there all along. At the end of Abaddon's Gate, when they're traveling back, and you know, and we, we, you know, we hear that Amos has actually been training her in repairs and engineering, you know, further repairs because she already learned, right? She already learned on her own in her quest for vengeance, and then you know, Amos is training her further at how to maintain the Resonante. It's like she's going to become part of the crew, isn't she? And she did, uh, and I just think that's, I think that's really, I think that's really good. Um, all right, time to run through a list of all the characters I can possibly remember that are remotely important enough to actually talk about. So Detective Miller. I love Detective Miller. Great character. Like I said in the beginning of the first video, he's a great rounding character, a great way to kind of like put something in that's super familiar, but also out of place um, in his time, right? Um, but I, I I love his dog of determination, even though he's clearly like down on his luck and he's depressed and everything. But there, there's just something about his determination to try and figure out what's going on that makes him super relatable, and he makes a good he makes a good counterpoint to James Holden, you know, because of course Holden is in that book he's super naive, super, super stupid, honestly, in a lot of cases, and and 
Miller kind of helps to like, kind of like, hey kid, can you not be as silly, please? <laughs> You know, you know, it's very enjoyable. And of course, he comes back as a phantom later on in book three, in book four, in book nine. Um, and even though he's not a character anymore in so much as, you know, he's just a construct, really. At the same time, it's good to still have him around. You know, he doesn't become overbearing. He doesn't become a part of the story that just, like, kind of, like, drags it down because he's just... He's too present. You know, he's there just enough... You know, to give us that some of that old Miller personality and, and to help out. And that's about it. You know, good to see him. Um, and rather, he's a good character. What did I just say? And next up comes my, fa my other favorite character besides Clarissa, and that is Havasarala. Havasarala is absolutely... Is absolutely... Um, is, it's, she's just a presence. Even though she's constantly swearing and rude, abrasive, obnoxious, it is precisely because her personality is so strong. You know, this older Indian lady who's just bossing people around and, and constantly talking, you know, constantly talking back at people who probably have her dead to rights on more than one occasion. You know, and, you know, and but she's just, she just doesn't, she just doesn't, she just doesn't give a fuck, to put it to put it simply, as she would put it. She doesn't care, you know. She's a, she's this larger than life presence, and the way she kind of, the way she kind of like brings together like the you know the plots of the you know the first six books. First, well, really, it's like two to five, two to six, isn't it? You know, but her presence in the story in these books and, um, you know, it's it's just it's it's. Gosh, you know, and you know, and we, and we get to see her one more time in the seventh book. You know, we get to see her a little bit of her talking to Drummer, um, and then of course she passes away just before the beginning of the eighth book. And it, it's just like, what a solidly done character. Gosh, I could never, I could, you know, I. I just, it's so hard to talk about her because it's just like she's. She's, it's like she's bigger than the, the words I can use to describe her, I guess is the best way to put it. And it's just, you know, the expanse wouldn't be the expanse if she wasn't in it, you know, you need it. You need that character in there, you know, you know, just, you know, that character in there, the character in the places, in the halls of power, you know, becoming the secretary general by accident, basically, and stuff like that. It's just, yeah, gosh. <laughs> Absolutely one of my favorites. Um, let me think. What other characters do we have? I'm gonna skip anyone who I don't remember well enough to, like, say anything about. Which is gonna be most of them, to be fair. But, uh... I'm trying to think. I'm just scanning through. Alright, LV and Fias. I'm gonna, use, I'm gonna do them as a pair because they are a pair. They very much are a pair. Um, I like them well enough. Um, they didn't really do anything for me in book four, those two. But, at the same time, um... They are very, they're very unique. They're a very unique pair. You know, Fayez is kind of awkward, kind of goofy and everything. And then LV, you know, is very grounded down to earth. Very, not grounded down to earth. I mean, very aloof. Why is it, that's, I was thinking of Fayez still. But LV is very kind of aloof. You know, she's very logical. You know, she's, she's always thinking about important things. Whereas Fayez is always trying to not think about important things. There are, you know, they're opposites, but they're also, that's also what makes them work together. Um, I think that, uh, I think that the, uh, the ethical dilemma introduced in Leviathan Falls, where they're doing the experiments, where they're doing the experiments, you know, with Kara and Zan and, you know, and, and LV actively recognizes that Kara has become addicted to the dives into the, uh, to the, uh, BFE. Um, or the BFD, depending on, depending on your preference. You know, she knows it, and she knows that by making, by having Kara still do the dives is very, is unethical. Um, but at the same time, she's like, she doesn't know any other solution, because they're, because they're on a ticking clock, again, to try and save humanity here. So she decides to violate ethics until Amos Burton sets her straight. You know, and, uh... But on the whole, I think they are very. I think they were a very solid addition to the cast. It was 
just having them around was a good thing. You know? Um, let me think. Uh, Fred Johnson. Forgot about Fred Johnson, actually, since he come, appears way earlier in this, doesn't he? Uh, Fred Johnson is... Hmm, I don't know, really. There's not actually not much to say about him. Um, I think the thing I like the most about him, actually, is the way he's kind of, like... Is the way he's kind of haunted by the past, right? Um... You know, and the way he's trying to do things right by, like, by helping to represent the OPA to, um, you know, to the to the inner planets, to Mar Earth and Mars, you know. Um, but he's but he's like beset on all sides because he's he's like almost like a in a lot of ways like ethically and philosophically he's like a wiser, smarter James Holden, right? You know, he has this he's the same kind of idealistic tenor, but it's tempered by experience and by age. And by wisdom, you know, and yet he perseveres and he keeps going, even though he's beset on all sides. There's internal factions in the OPA. Earth doesn't really trust him. Mars is kind of diff different to him, right? You know, but at the same time, you know, he's, he's still trying. You know, he still tries until the day he has he strokes out and dies. Um, you know, it, it's like at the same time, he's like a character you respect. You know, I, I guess it's the best way to put it. You know, you know, Fred's the Fred is a character you respect, and that's just just how it is. You know. Um, all right, back to it. Oh, let me think. Who else is there? I'm not going to cover any of the incidental minor characters from just like a single book or whatever, mostly because I don't remember most of them. Like I do and I don't. Um, Marco Manaros, pretty good villain actually. Um, you know, his villainy is mostly centered around the fact that he's a psycho, a self-centered psycho who doesn't think farther ahead than the next big stunt he's going to pull, basically. You know, in another life, he might have just been, like, some sort of, like, daredevil flying, you know, flying ships, you know, um, you know, near, da you know, like, near dangerous locations like the Corona or the Sun or something. But here, he ends up being a person with power within the OP within his faction of the OPA, and it ends almost ends in total disaster for the human race. Um, you know, he's you know he's a he's a character that makes you angry, and is precisely because he's a character that's supposed to make you angry because he's a character who's stupid and venal and selfish, and he doesn't know that he's stupid and venal and selfish, and he doesn't care even if he is aware that he is stupid and venal and selfish. Selfish. Um, But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it, it, and making him a part of Naomi's past also was a very interesting way to go about it. Um, you know, to, to make them actually having once been, you know, lovers is just a, uh, it's like, oh, that's a wrinkle to add into Nemesis games, isn't it? Um, which then, of course, leads to, uh, Philip or Philippe, I suppose it would be. Um, because that's an accent on him, right? Anyway, but... I think that he's an interesting perspective character to have in um, Babylon's Ashes, you know, where it's like he's trying to make his father proud, right? So he's, you know, so he's so he's trying his hardest to make his father proud, and then he realizes that, you know, and of course he hates his mother, he hates Naomi, but he ends up realizing over time that it's actually the complete opposite, that his father's actually the bad person and his mother is the good person. And he eventually makes the right choice, and he eventually abandons the mission, the mission, his father's mission, and ends up saving his own life as a result. Of course, we never know what happens to him. There's no, at least in the books, we don't know anything about what his fate is after that. We don't really, you know, because he goes completely to ground. He doesn't even like, he doesn't even try to reconnect with his mother or anything. He just, he just disappears off the grid, basically, which is just as well because he's technically a terrorist, but. He was a good perspective character to have in the book with the most perspectives. Um, let's see, who else, who else do we have? Who else do we have? Should I move into the third trilogy? Is there anyone from the second trilogy that bears mentioning? Um, I feel like I'm kind of indifferent. I don't really have much to say about Michio Pa, so I'm going to keep her, so I'm just going to leave her alone. Um, I'm definitely missing a couple of characters that are probably worth mentioning, but... No one that's so important that it's like, if I miss them, I think that it kind of slaps you in the face. Uh, I think that only leaves me really with just like two characters or so left to do, which is of course um, Duarte and Teresa, because they're really the important ones. Everyone else is kind of minor. 
Um, everyone else is kind of minor. Duarte makes for another makes for another makes for a pretty good villain, um, mostly because he doesn't think he's a villain. As Holden describes him in *Leviathan Falls*, you know, he was really good at one thing, logistics, but he tricked himself into thinking that he was good at everything. And that's Duarte in a nutshell. You know, Duarte thinks that he is capable and smart enough to lead a to lead a human empire crossing, you know, 6,800 light years. Um, and that probably just isn't true. You know, that probably just isn't true. Um, he is very, he's very much just the sort of person where it's like he, because he thinks he's smart, you know, he, he, he plays the part and he has no, doesn't lack for self-confidence or anything. And it's like kind of frustrating actually it's kind of frustrating actually to read it because his perspective is always that of like you know i am the god emperor of humanity and you know and, and it's like i know what's best and everyone's like no you don't but he doesn't want to listen and on some level it's not even like he's totally wrong because it's not like he was it's not like he was incompetent in any way it's just that his methodology was wrong right his methodology methodology and his ideology were what was wrong um, with the choices he made and the direction he wanted to take humanity in. Um, but on the whole, though, I think he makes for a very, very interesting, compelling individual. And of course, in the last book here, he definitely then t tips off the deep end. He comes out of that catatonic state, but then immediately, in his attempts to save humanity, starts trying to change humanity into something that it's not. You know, he starts trying to turn it into a single unified consciousness. And, I mean, that is a solution to the problem, but it's the wrong solution to the problem because he will save humanity, but he's going to transform humanity utterly and completely in the process. And that's madness. That's absolutely madness, right? Um, and so, of course, he ultimately has, ends up having to be stopped. And it's interesting ensuring him as yet another threat on top of the aliens from beyond space. And then finally, I think that leads us to Teresa. Um, I don't particularly care too much about, like, say, Tanaka or anything, so I'm going to skip her as well. I can skip Pa. But um, Teresa... It's funny. At the beginning, in the beginning, I didn't really like Teresa too much. I don't know what... I don't know. I just... Like, under, like I, un I understood why she was there. I understood her journey. I understood her conflicts and her troubles and what was bothering her. Um... um You know, it's like, it's like on the one hand, it's like, I guess it was just, maybe it was precise because she was hard to relate to, that be, she was written precisely hard to relate to because she was hard to relate to. Maybe that was it. Um, it's kind of hard to grasp, I guess, because she's very, I don't know, because at the end of the day, I guess what I'm getting to is that I liked her, right? Um, I did feel like she was a little bit of a Clarissa replacement, the way they, the way she was handled narratively. Um... Which is slightly disappointing. I wish I wish she had found a bit more of a niche that wasn't quite so identical to Clarissa Mao. But at the same time, I'm glad that she came along on the Rosinante, and I'm glad that there was a conflict with what they were going to do with her and the difficulty of knowing what to do with her, and the fact that she had, you know, that she liked the crew and she wanted to stay with them. And when they tried to get rid of her on New Egypt, it was just like, you know, like it hurt her. Like it, and when it hurt her, it hurt me. Um. But at the same time, I understand why Holden wanted to drop her off there, right? Um, and at the end, I kind of, I did like her, and I felt for her, like, immensely, you know, when she watched her father die, and then she watched... Functionally, Holden, Holden was like a surrogate father, too, right? And she watched him die. She watched him sacrifice himself. Uh, what, yeah, she watched him sacrifice himself. You know, and it's like... I feel for her. I feel for that loss and that pain she must have endured, right? Um, you know, and, and, you know, she, she may, you know, she only appears in the last two books. She makes for a very good addition to the story. Um, and I, and, and of everything I complained about in the last book, for the, about the last book in the last video, I think it was Teresa's fate that I wanted to see the most. I wanted to know what happened to her more. 
because you know it's like it's hard to recover from that i think it would be very difficult to recover that recover from that kind of trauma in your late teens you know in your young adulthood like that and you know so early on and i just i wonder how she coped with it i wonder i wonder if she coped with it it looked like she was starting to already you know like with kara and zan and everything and but you know it takes more than a little bit of friendship to kind of get past that kind of stuff right so you know I, I wanted to know more about like what her fate was anyway all right so i'm done i just realized i'm really slouching in the chair it's because i'm because i'm starting to get tired i've recorded two videos in a row i'm um, probably not gonna get these out for a little while but getting them recorded is fine um i do want to i, I kind of want to talk one a little bit about the uh, technology and philosophy and so forth but i'm not sure if i'm ever gonna i'm not sure if i'm gonna get to that it will it's a tentative third video if i get to it i get to it if i don't i don't it's not that important as talking about the story and the characters though so we will leave it at that i want to thank you for watching um i really do enjoy doing these book reviews and I'm not, you know i can't really say i'm very good at it i really do enjoy these reviews they are um they are just it's something different to do i'm not great at it i know uh, I, I, I feel like I talk about a lot of things very shallowly, but it's mostly just to kind of voice my thoughts and opinions and feelings. Um, and this would probably be easier if it was like a more of a conversation rather than just, um, you know, if it was more of a conversation rather than just like, <sighs> okay. um, my Chewbacca sense has kicked in. Um, but, uh. You know, the more of a conversation this would probably be I'd probably get a lot deeper. But for now it's just kind of like a it's kind of a shallow look, but it helps me to it just helps to kind of process thoughts a little bit. And it, it makes me happy to do it. So I wanna thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. And I will catch you in the next video, whether it's this or it's a gaming video or what. Who knows? But until next time, everybody. <laughs>